The Electronics Mag 15 has received a lot of hype in the US. I've got the Australian version of that here, the Vapor 15 Pro from Aftershock, which uses the same Intel design chassis. So let's check it out and find out why this is such an interesting laptop that you should consider. For the specs, there's an Intel i7-9750H CPU, NVIDIA GTX 1660Ti graphics, 16GB of memory and dual channel, a 15.6 inch 1080p 144Hz screen, and a 512GB NVMe M.2 SSD. For network connectivity, it's got Gigabit Ethernet, Wi-Fi 6, and Bluetooth 5. It's also available with RTX 2070 Max-Q graphics as well, and I'll test this out in the future. You can find updated prices to both configurations linked in the description. The body uses a magnesium alloy and has a matte black finish. It both looks and feels nice while coming off as extremely well built and premium, and there were no sharp corners or edges anywhere. The weight is listed at 1.87 kilos, and mine was a little under this. With the 230 watt power brick and cables for charging included, the total weight increases to 2.7 kilos. The dimensions are 35.6 centimeters in width, 23.4 centimeters in depth, and 2 centimeters in height. This thinner footprint allows it to have 7 millimeter thin screen bezels on the sides. The 15.6 inch 1080p 144Hz AHVA screen has a matte finish, viewing angles looked fine, and there's no G-Sync here. I've measured the colour gamut of the panel using the Spider 5 Pro, and got 98% of sRGB, 68% of NTSC, and 74% of Adobe RGB. At 100% brightness, I measured the panel at 305 nits in the centre, and with the 800 to 1 contrast ratio. So overall, pretty good results for a gaming laptop. I could use it fine for photo or video editing too. Backlight bleed in my unit was very minimal. Even in this worst case long exposure photo, there was only minor glow spots. But this will vary between laptops and panels. There was some screen flex, as the lid is on the thinner side despite the metal build, but the hinges being out towards the corners helped with stability. It was easy to open up with one finger, it felt very well balanced so no issues using it on my lap. Despite the thinner bezels, the 720p camera is found above the display in the center, and it's got infrared for Windows Hello support. This is what the camera and microphone look and sound like, here's what typing sounds like, and this is what it sounds like when we set the fan speed to maximum. So you can still hear me okay over the fan. The mechanical keyboard has per-key RGB lighting, and although it does illuminate all keys, the secondary functions were noticeably dimmer comparatively. The brightness can be adjusted between four levels or turned off using the F6 and F7 shortcut keys, as well as managed through the software, which lets you specify different brightness levels when on wall power or battery. Typing was nice, I really liked it. However, it was louder due to the mechanical keys. Here's how it sounds to give you an idea of what to expect. There was only a little keyboard flex when pushing down hard. Overall, the body felt very solid, likely due to the magnesium build. Keys have 2mm of travel, and I found the letter keys needed 62 grams of force to actuate. The glass touchpad uses precision drivers and worked very well. It feels very smooth and gives a satisfying click and has all the usual gestures. I liked its size and had no problems with it. Fingerprints and dirt were harder to see on the matte interior. It seemed to do a good job of hiding them, but as a somewhat smooth surface, it was still easy to clean. On the left from the back, there's a Kensington lock, air exhaust vent, USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type A port, and 3.5mm mic and headphone jacks. On the right from the front, there's full-size SD card slot, two USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type A ports, and another air exhaust vent. On the back, there are air exhaust vents towards the corners, then for the rest of the I.O., from left to right, we've got a Type-C Thunderbolt 3 port, HDMI 2.0 out, Gigabit Ethernet, and the power input. I like that they've got the bulkier I.O. running out the back as the thicker cables will be kept out of the way. The front is all smooth, and there's an RGB light bar here too, which can be controlled through the control center software, just like the keyboard. The lid is all matte black, with the Aftershock logo in the center, which has a mirrored finish. Opening it up was very easy, I just removed the 10 Phillips head screws and popped it out near the Ethernet port. Once inside from left to right, we've got two M.2 slots, both of which support NVMe PCIe storage, battery along the bottom, two memory slots in the middle, and Wi-Fi 6 card over towards the right. The speakers are found facing down near the front on the left and right corners. 
I thought they sounded below average when on a flat surface. They were definitely much nicer if I lifted the laptop up. Here's what we're looking at with maximum volume while playing music, and the latency mon results looked okay. There's a 6 cell 94 watt hour battery powering the laptop. I've tested it with the screen brightness at 50%, background apps disabled, and all keyboard lighting off. While just watching YouTube videos, it lasted for 7 hours and 20 minutes, and it was using the Intel integrated graphics due to Nvidia Optimus. This is one of the best results I've ever gotten, especially with this level of hardware. While playing The Witcher 3 with medium settings and Nvidia's battery boost set to 30 FPS, the battery lasted for 2 hours and 9 minutes. However, it was only capable of running at 26 FPS. At 14% charge left, it dipped to 3 FPS and lasted for 2 hours and 35 minutes in total, but I'm only showing playable times on this graph. The 230 watt power brick that's included with the Vapor 15 was plenty for these specs. I think the same size is used with the higher spec 2070 Max-Q version, so that's not surprising. There was no battery drain at all during any of my testing. Let's move on to the thermal testing. Air is pulled in underneath the machine through the fairly large vented area towards the back. It's then exhausted out of the two vents on the back and the left and right sides towards the back. There are two fans inside with plastic blades with three heat pipes shared between the processor and graphics. The control center software allows us to swap between different power settings, and I've tested using all available options. These modify things like power limits and fan speed. By default, the CPU was also undervolted by minus 0.05 volts. However, I've also pushed this further to minus 0.15 volts to see what further improvements this gets us. The benchmark mode option basically just maxed out the fan speed. I didn't find it to further adjust power limits higher than what the performance modes already applied. There's also a fan button next to the power button above the keyboard which lets you change between these same modes available in the software. It's just a nice shortcut. Thermal testing was completed in an ambient room temperature of 21 degrees celsius, so expect different results in different environments. At idle, it was on the warmer side. However, this was with the fan set to quiet and it was completely silent. It would run a bit cooler with small fan noise otherwise. The rest of the results are from combined CPU and GPU workloads, and are meant to represent worst case scenarios as I ran them for extended periods of time. The gaming results towards the upper half of the graph were tested by playing Watch Dogs 2, as I find it to use a good combination of processor and graphics. The stress test results shown on the lower half of the graph are from running the ADA64 CPU stress test with only the stress CPU option checked, and the Heaven GPU benchmark at max settings at the same time to fully load the system. Anytime the CPU was at 90 degrees Celsius, it was thermal throttling, and I was not able to modify this. Many other laptops have no such limit, and will happily run up to 100 degrees. I'm looking at you, Dell G5. In my opinion, 90 is a fair limit. You don't have to worry as much about thermals while still getting fair performance. The battery saver results were the lowest as this mode restricted power limits heavily. Temperatures rise with balanced mode as power limits rise a little here. Then the highest temperatures were seen with performance mode. With the stress tests running, it wasn't possible to fully remove the CPU thermal throttle, even with the cooling pad and additional undervolting. With this particular game, there were some spikes to 90 degrees, but on average, even just in performance mode without any modifications, it was below this on average. And we can see how the changes helped improve this. The GPU also gets capped to 75 degrees, and I found that this made my averages sit at 74, as they just spiked up to 75 but didn't stay there constantly. As a result, the GPU was thermal throttling due to this limit anytime performance mode was used, even with the cooling pad. Just to be clear, thermal throttle limits aren't necessarily a bad thing. They keep the laptop getting too hot. As long as we still get good performance, then it's not an issue. So let's see what we're looking at. These are the average clock speeds for the same tests just shown. The GPU clock speeds in battery saver or balanced mode were quite low. We'll see some gaming FPS numbers with the different modes soon though. The CPU speed rose significantly in balanced mode, and was about the same in performance mode. However, performance mode also improved GPU performance. As thermal throttling was the limit on the CPU, adding the cooling pad or instead raising the CPU undervolt by an extra minus 0.1 volts or so improved performance. With the best results seen when combining the two together, the changes were more pronounced in the stress tests. While playing this actual game, we weren't too far behind the 4GHz all-core turbo boost speed of the 9750H anyway, but the extra undervolt was enough to get us there. 
These are the TDP values during these same tests. Basically, the 1660 Ti was not reporting as hitting its 80 watt limit due to the thermal throttling at 75 degrees. However, I'm not too sure how accurate the GPU results are. A number of others have reported inconsistent reporting with hardware info on this machine, so take them with a grain of salt. Otherwise, we're seeing quite good CPU performance. Even under combined CPU and GPU workloads like these, it's constantly able to average around 50 watts. Which is good when you consider many other machines cap this to 45, triggering power limit throttling. Power limits in performance mode were not an issue at all here, as the CPU has a 65 watt PL1. Here are some Cinebench results to show CPU performance. In this CPU only workload with performance mode, the result from the 9750H was pretty decent due to the higher power limit of 65 watts. And with the extra undervolt, a score of above 3000 was possible. A good result for this CPU. It was possible to improve upon this a little more by using a cooling pad, however 90 degrees was still the primary limit. So how do these different changes actually affect game performance? Battlefield 5 was tested in campaign mode at ultra settings. The battery saver mode was unplayable, at least with the ultra preset. Balanced was somewhat more usable, but it was still about half the frame rate of performance mode. Extra undervolting and using a cooling pad was able to give us a small 4% improvement to average FPS. As for the external temperatures where you'll actually be putting your hands, at idle it was in the mid 30s in the center, no issues here. With the stress tests running in the battery saver mode, it's only getting a few degrees warmer. As we saw earlier, the power limits in this mode are still very low. Stepping up to balanced mode got a little warmer, mid 40s in the center and up to 50 right up the back in the middle where it was now starting to get hot. Granted you don't really need to touch there. With performance mode enabled, it's actually a little cooler now while also performing better, as the fan speed increases, as you'll hear next. At idle in the battery saver mode with the quiet fan profile, it was completely silent. With the stress tests running in the same mode, it was still quiet, but as we saw earlier, resource heavy games didn't really work. It gets a little louder in balanced mode, and despite the lower GPU power we saw earlier, the higher CPU performance did make many games playable. In performance mode, it does get quite loud. Unfortunately, there was no way in the control center software that came installed to customize the fan curve, but speed will vary based on workload. I'm showing a worst case here. If you want to set the fans to maximum all the time, you have the option of enabling benchmark mode. Overall, the thermals were looking quite good, mostly thanks to the 75 degree limit that's in place for the GPU and 90 degree limit for the CPU, combined with the default minus 0.05 volt undervolt. I've been told that Intel specifically designed this unique thermal limit for the Vapor 15 so that the laptop can achieve the best possible operating surface temperatures, while also keeping longevity and reliability in mind. The trade-off is a little lower performance due to this BIOS level setting. To be fair though, as we'll see in the gaming results next, it was still one of the better 1660 Ti machines I've tested performance wise. So basically, you just don't need to concern yourself as much with thermals here. That default undervolt is appreciated. I'll also note that with the latest control center software installed that Aftershock have available, I didn't have any options that seemed to indicate an equivalent of Electro Boost. I also haven't tested with raising the GPU thermal limit. However, you can check Bob's results with this using the card in the top right to get an idea of how this changes things. Next, let's take a look at some gaming benchmarks. I've tested these with the power and fan profile set to performance for best results. Control was tested walking through the start of the game, and I found medium settings to play quite well with above 60 FPS. High settings didn't go too badly. I don't think the game really needs a super high frame rate, but during fights, I did find medium to work better and it still looked good. Battlefield 5 was tested in campaign mode, and it was playing alright even with ultra settings. The 1% low performance didn't change much between setting presets, and 100 averages were hit with medium and below. Borderlands 3 was tested with the built-in benchmark and DirectX 11 as 12 is still in beta. In this test, high settings was required to hit a 60 FPS average, though we could get near 100 and above with low settings. 
Apex Legends was tested with either all settings at maximum or all settings at the lowest possible values, as it doesn't have predefined setting presets. It was playing fine, even maxed out, with above 100 FPS averages, while minimum settings seemed to be hitting a 144 FPS frame cap. Ghost Recon Breakpoint was tested with the game's built in benchmark, and Ultra settings was still reaching above 60 FPS in this test, with 100 only just reached with a low setting preset. Fortnite was tested with the replay feature in the new Chapter 2 map. This is my first time testing with the new map, so the results probably aren't too comparable with my previous results. In any case, 100 FPS averages were still possible even with epic settings. CSGO was tested using the Uletical FPS benchmark, and as a game that depends primarily on CPU power, the results are a little better than most other i7 laptops likely due to that small default undervolt. Dota 2 was tested playing in the middle lane, and as a primarily CPU driven game, the results were good, but not really much different compared to a similarly specced machine that isn't undervolted. Regardless, absolutely nothing to complain about with these results. If you're after more gaming benchmarks, check the card in the top right corner where I've tested 20 games in total on this machine. Let's also take a look at how this config of the Vapor 15 compares with other laptops. Use these results as a rough guide only, as they were tested at different times with different drivers. In Battlefield 5, I've got the Vapor 15 highlighted in red near similarly specced machines. The results here are good. Although it is below the Helios 300 with same specs, it was still above the other machines I've tested with the same specs, including the Aorus 7 and Lenovo Y540. Granted, the Y540 did have a much better 1% low result. These are the results from Far Cry 5 with ultra settings in the built-in benchmark. As a CPU heavier test, it's further behind the Helios 300 with same specs this time, likely as that has a bigger CPU undervolt. However, the performance was still a little ahead of the Lenovo Y540 and Aorus 7 with same specs, so fair results. Overall, the performance from the Vapor 15 seems to be above average when compared with other laptops that have the same GTX 1660 Ti and i7 9750H with dual channel memory. The small stock CPU undervolt would be giving it an edge over most other laptops. The Vapor 15 with these specs is easily able to play modern games at 1080p even with higher settings without any issues. So it'll be interesting to see how much better the 2070 Max-Q version does when I get it. You'll definitely want to get subscribed for that comparison. Now for the benchmarking tools. I've tested Heaven, Valley, and Superposition from Unigen, as well as Firestrike, TimeSpy, and Port Royal from 3DMark. Just pause the video if you want a detailed look at these results. I've used Crystal Diskmark to test the storage, and the 512GB NVMe M.2 SSD was performing well. However, this will vary based on your drive selection when ordering. The SD card slot was also performing fairly compared to most other laptops I've tested. I'm just happy it's got one at all. For updated pricing, check the links in the description, as prices will change over time. Here in Australia, the Vapor 15 starts at $2,250 Australian dollars, though that's with single channel memory. Upgrading to dual channel for $70 would greatly increase performance, and if you're not comfortable changing the pace yourself, I'd recommend paying for the better paste, as CPU thermals directly impact performance when under load due to the 85 degree limit. To get the 2070 Max-Q, it's a 780 Australian dollar upgrade path, which is quite a lot. Personally, I think the 1660 Ti is a great sweet spot for most people in terms of value to performance ratio, but we'll check out how the 2070 Max-Q version performs in future videos. As most of my viewers are US based, I'll just briefly note that the Mag-15 seems to start at $1600 US dollars, which is actually more expensive than what we pay in Australia after conversion, which isn't usually the case. With all of that in mind, let's conclude by looking at the good and bad aspects of the Vapor 15 gaming laptop. Overall, this is quite an impressive machine. I really liked the solid metal build quality and clean look. The features are also on point. It's got a large battery, which resulted in excellent battery life. It's got Thunderbolt 3, so you could also use an eGPU or other accessories. And it's got an SD card slot. Based on the performance this thing is able to offer, I'd gladly swap over to it from my thermally throttled Aero 15X. Speaking of thermal throttling, the Vapor 15 is configured to throttle performance back when the CPU reaches 90 degrees Celsius and 75 for the GPU. This can be seen as good or bad depending on how you look at it. It could be good as it ensures the internals are not getting too hot even when under heavy load, possibly increasing longevity of the device. It also means the machine doesn't feel like it's going to melt. The downsides are of course that you're potentially missing out on extra performance that could otherwise be achieved by running a little warmer. 
However, the results I was seeing with these limits seem to be enough in most cases anyway. From my own testing, I think they've made a good compromise here. There wasn't that much improvement while playing games and using a cooling pad and pushing the CPU under vault further. It was just fine at stock. As we saw in the gaming benchmarks, compared to other 1660 Ti laptops, it's still above average. So the performance is still there despite the temperature limits, which is why I think this is fine, though it could potentially be more of an issue in warmer environments. The screen was decent for a gaming laptop in terms of colour gamut and brightness, while bleed in my unit was minimal, but that will vary. In the end, I really liked most aspects of this machine. It's got good specs that perform well, doesn't get hot, has a decent screen, mechanical keyboard, excellent battery life, includes things most others are missing such as SD card slot, Thunderbolt 3 and Wi-Fi 6, all while still being on a smaller size for a 15 inch machine, making it lightweight and portable, and that's how I like my laptops. If I had to nitpick, I would have liked to have seen better fan customization available as it can get on the louder side running in performance mode. And I know many people are okay to run their machines warmer if they can keep it quieter. In my opinion, the Vapor 15 seems to be offering pretty much everything I like at a fair price point compared to the competition such as Gigabyte's Aero series. Although that does have other benefits such as the option of an OLED screen. If you're just purely after a gaming laptop, then there are cheaper options with the same specs like the Acer Helios 300. But if you need the extras, then this is looking like a good option. Let me know what you thought of the Vapor 15 gaming laptop from Aftershock down in the comments. And if you're new to the channel, consider getting subscribed for future laptop reviews and tech videos like this one.